Hello everybody, my name is Mihai Karabash and today I'm going to present you the current status report for porting Beehive on ARM. Uh, I gave half of this presentation three months ago in Tokyo at BeehiveCon 2016. Have, has anybody been to BeehiveCon? <coughs> okay, great. Uh, because I didn't want to speak about this then, but uh, Michael Lecter and Peter Graham asked me to do this and somehow I revealed some of the details then. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll start to present myself and then we'll continue with the uh, current status of the work I'm doing and also then I'm going to present you the steps I've been through to be able to run uh, Beehive on ARM. Uh, first of all, I'm a PhD student uh, at Politecnica University of Bucharest in Romania and I'm also a teaching assistant for operating courses, uh, operating system course. Uh, system architecture and networks. I've been in, in the BSD world since 2012. Uh, I was working on Dragonfly BSD SMT scheduler. Uh, basically, the Dragonfly BSD uh, scheduler uh, didn't recognize the hyper-trading CPUs. It, it considered that the hyper-trading CPUs normal cores, and when, when uh, it was trying to schedule high load works on two threads of the same core, it has very poor. It had very poor performance. Basically, what I did then was uh, to improve the scheduling de decisions and spread the high loading, uh, high, high loading um, uh, jobs to different cores. Uh, then, in the next year, I've implemented the extended page tables from Intel on their V kernels. Their V kernels some, some, somehow some kind of jails and had a um, shadow page table work implemented. So basically this was para virtualized and they were moving very, very slow. And they decided to use a hardware feature, the extended page tables for the virtualization, from the virtualization, the same Beehive is using, in order to dish the shadow page table they had. Uh, here I met Neil Natu, one of the authors of Beehive which proposed me to work in the next year at the project uh, instruction caching. This project, unfortunately, didn't um, end quite well. What is instruction caching? You, uh, you know that besides normal instructions, there are some uh, accessing to hardware that cannot be done directly from the VM, and you have to emulate these accesses. Uh, to emulate an instruction is very, very um, time consuming. You have to find the, the source address, you, you have to manually work that virtual address to the physical, grab the instruction, decode it, and we know that x86 instructions are very complicated to decode, and then execute. Uh, he, what he wanted me to do is basically cache these instructions based on the virtual address. And whenever we have a fault, find that in, uh, search in our hash table, and if at that point um, there, wa there was a fault in the, in the past, we already have decoded the instruction and save a lot of time. Uh, this didn't save us much time because the time searching for the, for the instruction relative to the context switch was very, was very uh, little in, uh, in distance. This would help us when the Beehive would have uh, implemented uh, the, um, sorry, when we'll be able to, to run uh, nested hypervisors. So for example, on top of Beehive run, run KVM. Then instruction caching would help us have better performance. And in 2015, I started porting Beehive on R, the current project I will present uh, today. The work started last summer. I've been working all last summer full time on this. Uh, and after that, I've been uh, working only on weekends. I didn't have much time because of my PhD and teaching assistant. And also, this year, I'm finishing PhD in October, and it's a little bit uh, tricky to work on both. Uh, also, it's nice to mention that Peter Graham uh, mentored me in this last last project and helped me go going through it. Okay. Other than this, uh, for the BSD, uh, for the BSD world, 
Basically, I'm promoting Beehive projects to my master and diploma students. They have final projects and they need subjects, and I'm trying to push them the, some Beehive projects to mentor them. Uh, until now, I had two uh, successful projects, the ATA emulation for Beehive, uh, which are, uh, right now is under review, and the NE2000 emulation. This is a network card, a wall, old network card emulation, to, also for Beehive. Both of these are completed and are waiting to get into the head. Uh, also, I have two students which are working on uh, Beehive on ARM, but they are somehow at the beginning and I'm trying to push them to, uh, to know better the, uh, the source code to, to be able to actually do some useful code. So this, is a, this was about me and my implication in the BSD world. Let's start talking about hardware system virtualization. As you all know, in x86, basically it's adding a new privilege level in which the hypervisor is running. Okay? In, at Intel and AMD, it extends the current kernel mode. Basically, the current kernel mode, privilege mode, is extending with some new instructions, and it's called the root, kernel root mode. No, nothing, uh, nothing new, only new instructions are added. At ARM, uh, they add a basically new privilege level. So, in that level, you don't have access to the instructions that you had access in kernel mode, in privilege mode. You, have, you only have access to the uh, instructions for the hypervisor. This means that you cannot run type 2 hypervisor on ARM. Let's get back a little and, uh, and I will explain what, what is a type 1 and type 2 hypervisor. A type 1 hypervisor, it's, it's the one that is running directly bare, bare metal on the, on the hardware and is doing only this. For example, Xen um, is a bare metal, is a type one hypervisor. It's running directly on the hardware and it has its own management uh, system, management memory and so on. Um, VMware SAXI, it's also a type one hypervisor. A type two hypervisor, it's a hypervisor that is using the host management tools in order to run the VMs. For example, VMware Workstation is a type two hypervisor. KVM from Linux is a type two hypervisor because it's using all the features from the Linux kernel. Beehive is a type two hyper hypervisor, the same, okay? So basically we aren't able to run uh, Beehive on ARM because Beehive is a type two hypervisor. Uh, basically, you have to rewrite a lot of the code in order to, to run uh, FreeBSD in hypervisor mode. You have to rewrite all the low-level uh, code, and even then, you can run user-space applications directly on hypervisor mode. You have to have the kernel mode. Okay, so we have to figure out how to solve this issue. because we want to leverage on the FreeBSD management mechanisms. For example, we don't want to create our own page table uh, management system and so on. We, we don't want to create our own drivers. We will insert only a, a small portion of code in heap mode. Basically, that is a bridge. Whenever the FreeBSD host OS wants to execute um, a hypervisor instruction, it will call that bridge and tell him what instruction to execute, okay? Other type two implementations are from KVM. The virtual open systems guys did the same thing and have a prototype running KVM on ARM using this way, okay? The performance penalty using this bridge is not so, uh, is not so uh, big. Right now, we are able to run a Beehive FreeBSD virtual machine on top of a, a FreeBSD host. Uh, the output is get out to a para-virtualized serial console, so we have our own console, which is para-virtualized. It's written in the guest and in the host also. Uh, it's getting to, the in, to starting the init process, the, so the Gebner boots up until it starts the init. Uh, but at this point, the VM is flooded with um, some spurious interrupts. I'll come to this issue further as we advance on the steps I've taken in order to be able to boot Beehive, okay? 
the first uh, the first step was to boot FreeBSD on fast models. Uh, I've worked on an um, emulated uh, device, the fast models from the ARM, because it let me uh, show the uh, it um, it was show me the the hardware state at each point. When I have the problem, I could see the content of the registers and what it is fails and so on. So we didn't use an actual hardware for this development. Okay, but FreeBSD didn't have support for this fast model platform from ARM. Uh, approximately two weeks took me to boot the FreeBSD because I found uh, some bugs in the flatten device tree and the open firmware subsystems. So these two basically are, are systems that are processing some input files that describe the platform. What interrupts it has, at what addresses it's the memory, uh, the interrupt controller, at what address is the timer, and so on. Okay, but this one had some bugs in processing the FDTs got from ARM. I had to modify the, in eventually I have to modify the input files in order the, the parser from here to work. Uh, then I crafted an init code in Locor. Locor is the first uh, file which it get executed when uh, a FreeBSD on ARM starts. Uh, basically here, I, I verify if the, the board is in heap mode. Okay, the board boots up in heap mode, it's, an, it's a must. So if it booted in, uh, in supervisor mode, in kernel mode, we cannot configure the board uh, in order to run, a hyper, uh, to run a virtual machine, sorry. Mm, then I install some stub exception vector for heap mode. So it's a new exception vector, especially, especially created for virtualization. And this exception vector has one important entry, the entry which uh, it, it's executed in heap mode. Basically I install there a, a function, a stub function that doesn't do anything, just it sets a new, hi a, a new, um, a new instruct, a new, exception vector, or guess the current ex exception vector, for me, uh, for me to initialize it later. And also I have a, a variable which I mark the virtualization available for the user when one starts a virtual machine. Uh, as you all know, the, the code for, the kernel code for Beehive resides in sysamd64 VMN. So here is all the code. Uh, basically, I copied this code here and preserved only the interface. Uh, it should have been in sysvmm, uh, but when they started, they introduced there a lot of machine-dependent code, and this is why they put it in, in AMD64. Theoretically, we should have C, uh, sysvmm slash, and there would be all the, uh, functions in the, inter the common interfaces, and under AMD64 and ARM would be implementing the machine dependent code. Basically, to simplify, only I copy this and I try to preserve the interfaces as much as I could. In some places I couldn't because they were adding some x86 registers in, in the function headers and it was not possible. Um, after stab stabilizing the ARM implementation, we can make a common interface uh, like KVM has. I created some low-level routines for installing the exception vector for heap mode. I was using that stub uh, exception vector that I installed earlier, earlier to install the final exception vector because right now I had all the information about uh, the hypervisor at the init time I didn't know what would be running on my hardware. So at this point I actually know uh, all the details. Uh, basically uh, when I execute the heap instruction, the heap instruction is it's a new instruction added to the instruction set and when I execute these instructions an exception is, is caused and it gets executed the, the function pointed in the exception vector installed here. Um, 
how the host OS is making hypervisor calls. As I told you earlier, the host OS is running in privilege mode, kernel mode, and cannot execute any uh, hypervisor calls. Basically, it executes the heap instruction, which, uh, which sends in, in hypervisor mode, and after the heap instruction, we add a function address, an uh, address to a function that the heap mode would execute then. Also, we made verifications that, the, that, that this heap call is coming from the, our host OS and not from a virtual machine who wants to corrupt our hypervisor, because this is very important. Okay. Further, uh, we need to do some memory mapping. We need that the virtual address sent by the host OS to be the same in the host OS and in heap mode, because the hypervisor mode is another address space in the end. Which with his own mappings. Uh, further, we have a new uh, level of translations, uh, stage two translations, like the EPT from Intel, extended page tables from Intel. Basically, uh, they are the normal page tables, which translates from the virtual address to the um, the physical address. And right now, there are another sets of page tables that translate from the virtual address of the virtual machine to the physical address of the virtual machine and then to the physical address of, of the host. So there are two translations. And this is a uh, stage two translation. It's the one that translates from the physical address of the virtual machine to the physical address of the host and is controlled by the hypervisor. Basically the hypervisor controls what portions of memory are available to the VM. We had here one issue. Uh, LPA is, is large physical address uh, extensions. Uh, it's not supported by FBSD uh, manage, memory management uh, code. So we cannot rely on FBSD memory management code to build the page tables. We had to create our own code for this. This is somehow opposite of what I told you earlier. We rely on the management tools. We uh, right here, we didn't have uh, this opportunity. We implement the LPAE supporting the VMM code. We support only, uh, we support 40, uh, 40 bit of physical addresses. This is the maximum. Uh, and a three level page table, uh, a three level page table format. There are multiple formats with two levels, one level, and so on, but we implemented only one uh, because of the simplicity. Here we had one uh, issue. On 42 bits, we don't have the DMAP mechanism. What is DMAP? It's direct map. Basically, with DMAP, we can find the virtual address of a given physical address with only one search. Okay? We have this feature in the x86 FBSD kernel uh, on 64 bits, but here we don't have this, um, this mechanism because the 42 bits at the space is too uh, is too uh, too uh, is too small. We cannot do uh, this kind of map. Uh, we had to create a shadow page table, basically a second uh, pair of page tables where we retain the uh, virtual address besides the physical address in the original ones. So we, when we reach the original page tables, basically we put there the physical addresses. In the shadow page tables, we put the virtual addresses. We need these virtual addresses when managing the page tables. Because again, uh, heap mode is not an address space, and when trying to access, um, we, access we access virtual addresses, not physical ones. Uh, then, as I, as I told you earlier, uh, we map the hypervisor code at the same address in heap mode and in host OS. Basically, the virtual address A in one in the host OS is the same as uh, the virtual address A in uh, the hypervisor mode. When the host OS sends an address to heap uh, to heap instructions to the uh, to heap mode, basically it, it can access it directly without doing anything else. Uh, after that, we implemented the low-level code, which is which is doing context switching between between the uh, between, between the host OS and the virtual machine. Okay, when the host OS wants to run the virtual machine, it's 
it sends a heap instruction. And in the heap instruction, it, said it sends the address of the VM run, okay? We end up in heap mode. In heap mode, it executes the VM run instructions, which, uh, so sorry, it executes the VM run function. It's a function written by me, which uh, basically save the current state, the host OS state, into memory, and loads the virtual machine, instruction pointer, registers, coprocessors, and so on. And then it jumps to the instruction pointer of the virtual machine and executes that virtual machine. When that virtual machine would, would try to do uh, anything sensible, gen, uh, uh, like accessing a, a hardware, an exception would occur and will end up in hypervisor mode back. Okay? And hypervisor mode will return to host OS to treat that exception. Okay? This is the whole flow. Uh, until here, I've worked on the kernel, uh, on the kernel code. Okay, basically the hypervisor. In order to be able to run a virtual machine, we need some user space uh, utilities which run the host OS image and instructs the uh, VMM code, the kernel code, to run the virtual machine. Like KMU with K KVM, like Beehive load and Beehive run on x86. The same uh, we should do on ARM. These are other utilities that have been written from scratch respecting the model from uh, x86. I've duplicated the code li uh, libvmm API. Uh, this is a library that, that uh, has all the VMM API, all the calls to the VMM, VMM API. So basically, Beehive log and Beehive are making calls from uh, this library. We are using this wrapper to simplify the operation, operations because there are a lot of IUCTLs in there and it would be uh, very messy to call them directly from Beehive log and Beehive code. Uh, okay. We crafted Beeh Beehive load arm. So Beehive load arm is, is similar with Beehive load from x86, only it's, it's for arm. In the end, we'd have the same executable, but we don't decide which is the common part, and this is why we created two executables. Uh, Behive load arm would map the guest OS memory and low its image, the kernel.bin, the kernel image. The kernel image also has in it the, the RAM disk. So at this point, we aren't using any, we don't have any block device. You are, we are using directly the RAM disk in the kernel image. Uh, then we implemented MMIO emulation using traps in st stage two translation. What this means is that in a stage two translation, we don't have any mapping for that uh, for the physical address of the virtual machine. And when the virtual machine was trying to access this, vir this, vir this physical address, uh, it causes an exception that and would end up in our hypervisor. And we would see that it's an address that we intentionally left unmapped and we'll take some action in there. For example, in, the, in, uh, in this case, we implemented the Pavel twice console. Whenever the, um, the virtual machine, the guest, was writing uh, letter A, for example, at an address, we catch that, uh, that write to an exception, and w uh, we put on screen uh, letter A. This is how the Pavel twice console functions. It's very, very simple. Okay, and starting virtualized interrupts. Uh, ARM offer, offer us um, some support for virtualizing interrupts, but it's uh, somehow uh, the job of the VMM to create the code for this. It, it isn't completely implemented in hardware. So, an interrupt controller on ARM has two main components, the distributor and the CPU interface. The distributor, it's the one that receives all the hardware interrupts and sends them to different CPUs through the CPU interface. So it's one CPU interface for each core. Okay, if, if we have two cores, we have two CPU interfaces. When an interrupt come, comes, uh, it goes to the distributor and this distributor forward this to the appropriate CPU interface. ARM provides virtual CPU interfaces for the guest. So this component is implemented in hardware. Okay, we don't we we don't have we have only um, 
to map that virtual CPU interface on the actual CPU interface of the EAST. But we need to virtualize the access to the distributor. So for example, when a virtual machine tries to disable an interrupt, it has to talk, uh, it has to, talk to the distributor. Uh, this part isn't virtualizing hardware. We have to catch that accesses and, sorry, and create our own distributor state per virtual machine in memory and do actions based on this. At the current status, we mapped the CPU interface over the CPU virtual interface. So the virtual machine can talk with the distributor theoretically. Uh, we created the virtual GIC infrastructure in the VMM code. This is the kernel code. And register the distributed accesses for in-kernel emulation. What this means is that uh, whenever a virtual machine tries to read or write the distributed registers, we cache the reads and writes and save the values that the virtual machine are sending, the virtual machine is sending to us. Right now, as I've, I've, um, I've told you at the beginning of this talk, the VM passes the, the GK initialization and goes further, but, uh, but ends up with some sparse interrupts due to the lack of proper distributed emulation handling. So the distributor, the distributor emulation isn't working properly, and this is why it's causing some spurious interrupts in the, in the guest. Uh, I'll detail you what is our current status with the distribution, distributor emulation, sorry. So we registered the distributor address, access, address range accesses for internal emulation. We created some internal structure to retain the state of the distributor for each VM. Okay, so each VM has its own distributor state. Uh, basically, what this retains are the configs of the interrupt. What interrupts are enabled, uh, what type of interrupts, edge or level triggered, wh uh, which of them are active, and so on. Um, given this state that is saving memory, we have somehow to send this state to the hardware. This state is sent to the hardware to uh, to what is called list registers, LR. The list registers are, uh, are uh, some hardware lists that need to be populated. For example, if uh, I put an interrupt number on the first, uh, on the first field of the, register, uh, of the list register, that interrupt would be active for the virtual machine. So basically I have to take all these interrupts that are active from here and put it here in order to be signaled to the CPU virtual interface of the virtual machine. Okay, so basically we have to do a synchronization between these ones and these ones. Uh, this is work in progress, so this is where, where we left. Um, okay. Further to have a running uh, yes, we have to have timer virtualization too. What we did is we used an unused timer from the board. So the board has had the generic uh, timer from ARM processor and also have an, a device called SP804, uh, which was unused, and I mapped this timer directly to the guest. But right now it isn't functioning properly because the interrupts aren't working correctly. So this, these two are related. Further, we would want to uh, implement the generic timer for the guest too, because ARM offers us um, virtualization support in hardware for, uh, for coupling the generic, generic timer to the virtual machine guests. Uh, what was the development platform? So I used the fast models from ARM for, uh, for emulating a Cortex A15. Unfortunately, I had a number of evaluation days on this. Uh, but I was last year in Cambridge when I met the ARM guys and they helped me at, on a basis of three months they were sending me a new license. Uh, so this hum, uh, somehow was solved. Uh, further, we wanted to run Beehive on a real hardware platform. I had an Exynos uh, uh, five, sorry, 5250. Uh, it's a Cortex A15 board, so it matched the emulated one. We, we, we first run KVM on this to, to make sure that the board was okay and had the hip mode enabled and so on. Uh, and then we tried to run our, our code. 
the code base that we, are wor we, we were working on was from April the last year and was too old. The Exynos wasn't, wasn't booting. The FreeBSD, the, so the FreeBSD, the normal FreeBSD system wasn't booting on, on the board. So we, had a, we did a rebase with the head. We had multiple uh, conflicts because it was one year and uh, one month difference of the code. Uh, we had one in Lockhore with the Andrews live heap. And we also fixed the problems with the virtual JIC uh, introduced by the new interrupt uh, platform, which permits multiple interrupt control. Uh, we get the latest U-boot because, again, I've said you at the, at the beginning of the talk, we need to leave the board in heap mode. So the board needs to be left in heap mode, not in the kernel mode, because otherwise we cannot run the hypervisor. Uh, and we got to the point that HVC, uh, sorry, HVC instruction is causing an undefined instruction exception. And we couldn't find why at that point because we don't have a JTAG. While we were debugging, the, uh, the board diffused to power up and we have an unfunctional board. Uh, this happened last week. I've talked with Peter Grechen and Andrew and we, we have chosen the QB board 2 to continue the work the all winner A20 SOC, which has a Cortex A7, which has virtualization extensions on it. It's on the way to Romania. By the time I will get there, uh, uh, Tuesday will be, uh, will, would be in Romania, and we would start working on this. Uh, what are the next steps in uh, evolving Beehive on ARM? Add SMP support to the VMM code right now, all the code paths are written only for the first CPU, CPU zero. Basically, we need to, uh, to add some instructions to get executed on the other CPUs synchronously, and also some logs. This wouldn't be hard, two, two weeks to one month work. Emulate more devices. So we want to emulate a serial console that is recognized by any kernel to be able to run any kernel on top of BSD, for example, to run Linux on top of the FreeBSD. And also emulate a disk, an MMC, maybe an MMC card or something like this. But here we, we could use the virtual infrastructure, which is in x86, and uh, this is how we could get compatibility with, uh, with Linux and Windows and so on. So Windows does not run on, on ARM, sorry. So Linux, basically. Yes, OK. This would be interesting. Uh, also, run multiple Beehive VMs. This, this one wasn't tested until now because it wasn't the, in the current best shape. Uh, also, try to run Linux as a guest OS on the Linux ARM. Unify the VMM interface. So basically, it's to have a unified interface and only a set of uh, user space executables that are uh, common for both platforms. And the last one is porting Beehive ARM to ARM V8. Uh, oh, the, uh, this one will be basically my next step after I finish the interrupt controller uh, work. So it would be about one month, one month and a half to work to port uh, Beehive on ARM V8. Basically, we have to copy all the VMM code there and modify um, the length of the, uh, the, the the length of the types uh, the data types sorry because it modifies from 32 bits to 64 bits and also we have the LPAE support that we don't have in in ARM uh, with uh, in ARM v7 so to conclude uh, basically we port Beehive on ARM or porting Beehive on ARM showed that the VMM interface design almost fits our needs uh, the VMM code uh, still has some arch dependent code which uh, would be removed. As I've told you, we lacked support for the LPAE support in the memory management system for RV7. And also type two hypervisor needs special care on ARM. So basically we had to create that bridge in heap mode in order to be able to execute the hypervisor instruction from the host OS. Thank you very much and if you have any questions, I'll be, uh, I will answer to them. Thank you. So, uh, you said that it did take a lot of stuff from JT, VMM, API. Can you actually take information from Beehive Load and Beehive, the x86 version? 
from beehive load, I've taken only uh, the bits that were show me, showing me how to map the guest memory and how to copy it. Only a few lines of code because all of the other lines were x86 specifics. Okay, and for Beehive, I took all the MMIO emulation because that was a generic uh, emulati emulation interface. I took the Power Virtualized Console, so basically I only adapted for ARM, but it, there weren't major modifications. Um, also, the loop, the Beehive run loop is the same, but I removed all the x86 specific because there, there, there were a lot of operations that was, were sending uh, x86 registers to the ISTLs, so I don't need that, those. So this is where we have to work, to, to remove these dependencies and so, somehow create a cleaner, uh, cleaner API. But the libvmm lib API is the same with the x86 registers removed. Okay, other questions please? Uh, actually, Xen does a lot, m a lot more work in in uh, in the heap mode. Uh, it does the memory measurement. Uh, it has a balloon driver. So, so, so we have, uh, we we have we have a, we ha have only a few lines of code in hypervisor mode that that only switches between host and guest. This is all the code that enters in there. So basically, all the decisions are made in are made in the host OS. But you to make it more uh, not really, but it. Uh, I don't think it makes it makes it more secure, but um, it help us leverage all the FreeBSD subsystem implemented until now. We ha don't have to write from scratch anything else, and if we have something tested and working until now, it's better than starting reinventing the wheel. So this is the advantage of Xen. Okay, if there aren't any questions, thank you very much. <laughs>